Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Sell, and this is my part of the celebration of Stereoscopic 3D. Uh, my little show here will be about the history of Viewmaster. Sorry to say many of the images are in 2D, but a lot of them do not exist as 3D versions. I hope you enjoy it. Here we have an early photo of Harold Graves. Uh, he was a photographer in the very early years. Here he is in front of a Model T Ford with all of his equipment. Harold became part of Sawyer's, which was a postcard company. Uh, they were usually sold as sets as well as singles. And here you see different sets being sorted. The uh, Sawyer service offered film processing as well. You would drop your film off at any local drugstore and these cars would pick it up and then they would return it there so you could pick up your prints in a few days. Here we see one of the original Sawyer's processing envelopes that you would get at the drugstore. You'd put your name on it and have it sent in. This one, I believe, is from the 1930s. Once the Model T's started wearing down, uh, Sawyer's figured it was easier just to get motorcycles, because obviously film does not take up much room, and these three-wheeled motorcycles did a very good job for them. Here we have a very early photo of William Gruber when he first came to the United States. He immigrated from uh, Germany and he was promised a job here, but when he got here, that job was no longer available. So he had to make a living as best he could. He turned to piano tuning. Here we see one of the original postcards that William would send out whenever he was going to be in a certain town. He would send these a week in advance, and he could make appointments with the local people to get their pianos in top condition. During this time, he met Norma Lentz. Uh, he was in love with her instantly. She thought he was a little short, so it took a while for him to get together, but eventually they were married and they were extremely happy. They spent their honeymoon at the lodge at Oregon Caves, and Oregon Caves has a wishing stone. You rub the stone and make a wish, and Norma made a wish that her husband's idea for this great new 3D system would come to fruition. And as we all know, it did. At this point, Harold Graves entered the picture again. William was photographing a deer with his pair of Bantam specials, and Harold happened to step in front of him right as he was taking a shot. Uh, Harold knew instantly what he had done, so he, being a photographer himself, he profusely apologized, and the two got talking, and William found out that Harold was with Sawyers, and he pitched his idea later that night, and the Viewmaster was born. Here we see some of the Viewmaster viewers, uh, the one in the top middle is the original prototype. Uh, that is no longer in existence, I'm afraid. At least I have never seen it or heard of anyone seeing it. On the left, we have the Model A viewer. On the right, we have the Model B viewer. And on the bottom, we have the Model C, which was one of their longest lasting viewers. Uh, the A and B both were a clamshell type, and that was very soon changed to the C where you just inserted the reel into the top. Uh, 
Uh, here we have one of the early prototype reels. If you notice, the outside has round holes for the advance instead of the later rectangle. This was soon changed because the uh, pin that was advancing the reel would not let go and the image would just slide back and forth. So they had to quickly design a new system for that. Here we have a photo of very early reel production. At this point, it was still 90% hand done. You can see the heat seal presses against the wall. In the front, we see people putting film chips on. Everything was done by hand at this point. William Gruber designed a reel making machine, which saved a lot of this process, which would actually have a machine put all the film chips into place in the perfect position. They were much better aligned than the originals and much, much faster and saved the company a lot of work. Here is a photo of the first type reel making machine. If you notice, the reel coming off the machine here does not have a top on it yet. That was still put on by hand at this point. The later machines assembled the entire reel and also printed them. Viewmaster made good use of the stereoscope as advertising, but it was all negative advertising about the stereoscope because the images were black and white. You only had one image instead of seven. And of course, Viewmaster was in color, which was a big improvement. This is the inside of the brochure where they're talking about how great the Viewmaster product is. And it was pretty good because it basically was one of the two systems that put the stereoscope out of business. Between Viewmaster and TrueView, it was pretty much the death knell for the old stereo cards. Here we have a Model B viewer assembly line and packaging line. This is during World War II, and if you notice, there's only one man in the room. Uh, it's an entire female line because all the men were at war. During World War II, film was rationed, and Sawyer's was very afraid they were going to go out of business because of this. But they were very lucky and got a contract from the U.S. military to make training reels for the Air Forces and Navy and a few other branches. Uh, the reel shown here is a test of cones of fire. Cones of fire are the areas that are covered by machine guns on bombers. So if you were attacking an enemy bomber, you would know the precise angle to attack from. And hopefully that would work for you. Uh, they also made reels for the U.S. Forest Service. And they always made sure that they had a little extra film so they could still make some reels to sell on the side. Here we see a brochure for the Model B viewer, which was uh, sold right after World War II. Uh, as it shows here, they had three years of continuous use with the military. So they were well tested and they used that for advertising to their advantage. They came out with brown and blue versions. However, the public really didn't care what the color was too much. So black went back as being the standard color when they went to the Model C. Here is an image from 1950 from Progress, Oregon. They had just purchased land there to build their plant. The idea was that they would build the plant and they bought a bunch of land around it as well, hoping that the employees would move out there. But everybody thought it was too far out of town, so they just drove in. Here we see some of the walls being put up. This is a an image of the iconic Viewmaster water tower being 
erected. And when it was all done, we had a combination of Sawyer's and Stereocraft Engineering in this uh, really nice complex. Here is the uh, office as you walk into the building. Uh, that's a very nice display on the front there, one I've never been able to find yet. The Model C viewers uh, were compression molded. They used Stokes machines. Uh, they were made of Bakelite. But even as brittle as Bakelite is, the Model C viewer, unless you dropped it from a second story building, they were almost indestructible. Since the war is over by then here, we have men back at the assembly lines assembling the Model C viewers. Most of the work was still done by hand. Here is another shot of the uh, C viewers being assembled and boxed. And another shot of the same thing. Here is a factory overview of the floor. Uh, if you look in the front in the middle there, those are the fronts for the junior projector, so you could project your reels. However, those were also only 2D. They would project one side of the reel. Here again, we have another assembly area shot. And here we see the light attachment for the Model C being made. It used 2D batteries, and it worked fairly well, but it was quite heavy to hold. Here we see one of the copy cameras, where the Viewmaster images would be made on the film. Uh, this one, I believe, is actually from the service where personal reels would be copied. Here is one of their major copy cameras. If you notice here, they're photographing one side at a time, and they would take the original image, which was usually a medium format or at least a, a standard 35 millimeter format, and then rephotograph it on the movie film to make the chips for the Viewmaster reels. Here is another view of uh, that type of a system. Here we see lenses being dropped into the uh, Model G viewers, which were then press fitted after they were inserted. Here the uh, back of the uh, Model G is being finished with the uh, real lock mechanisms being installed. And here the lever is installed. Here we see an image of the talking Viewmasters. This was their first attempt at a talking version. Uh, they actually had a record attached to the back of the reel, and it was a needle that played the record uh, very similar to a Victrola. It didn't work all that well for the sound, and the biggest problem was viewing the images. You were actually looking through a spinning plastic disc of the record with the lines in it, and it gave a very psychedelic effect, but it was not a good effect for 3D, so it was very quickly dropped from the line. The packaging changed over the years. Uh, instead of just having little boxes for the viewers, they started making gift sets. And at one point, they were making these canisters. My friend Dave Hitchcock was the uh, director of quality control at that point, and he was on vacation for a day. 
and they started to line up, and they had the cans upside down. And the fellow that started the line was actually the big boss. So Dave, having a big sense of humor, took a can opener to the bottom, which you would have been the top when they reversed it, and he said, I love the new design, however, they're a bit hard to open. So that was a big joke at the plant for several weeks. Besides buying uh, ViewMaster at photo shops and department stores, you could also order them directly from ViewMaster. Here is a lady filling a mail order. And they go. This is an image of the ViewMaster personal camera. The camera came out in the 1950s, about the same time or so as the Realist. And the big feature here was that you could get 72 stereo pairs onto a roll of film. The uh, camera, although new to the public, had been in experimental stages since 1945 or even 1944. I'm not sure exactly of the dates there. But Carl Kurz actually built several handmade cameras and they tried making special reels so they could make personal reels. This one here is taken by William Gruber himself and it is of Hood River in 1945. The personal reel itself, although it looks simple, is really not. Here is the blueprint for one. It is a sandwich of three pieces. You have uh, two pieces of the outer paper and then you have a metal spider in it that holds the film chip in place. Uh, the precision of this was really quite well done for something that would be inserted by the public. Here, reels are being stamped out of rolls of paper. And here, the pieces are assembled into the final personal reel. If you look on the left there, you have the top, the bottom, and the spiders. Uh, the whole thing was heat sealed together. And it worked quite well, and this is the machine that was having the problem, and that's why ViewMaster quit producing the personal reels. Here is a stereo image of a cutaway personal reel, where you can see the uh, slices of paper with the metal insert. Uh, here is another factory image of... Uh, reels being inserted. This is actually an earlier version of the personal reel that did not have the metal spider. They just had this uh, paper pocket that was expanded. It worked, but it was not as precise. Here we have a photo of the uh, ViewMaster film mounting service. When you shot your own personal reels, you could send your film in for processing and they would even mount it for you and send it back to you in the personal reels. This poor lady sat there all day long inserting film chips. I don't know if I would like that job or not. Here we have artist Florence Thomas working on a set from the sword and the stone. Uh, it gives you a good idea of the size of the sets and how complex they were. Each one of these involved a whole lot of work, uh, so when you see the uh, clay figure reels, make sure you appreciate them. Here Florence is working on a princess from one of the uh, fairy tale sets. She used unfired clay, and then let it dry, and then afterwards the figures were painted. Here she is painting one of the princesses. Uh, each movement required a new figure, so there was a lot of work involved for each scene. Here we have Florence along with a grouping of her work. 
most of which I'm very sorry to say no longer exists. However, the castle in the upper left-hand corner I did manage to save, and I have it in our collection. Here we have Florence again with some of her work doing a television show. Uh, this was for the Sawyer story. Uh, that can be found on the internet if anybody wants to watch that. It was a uh, setup of the, how the entire factory worked. Here's another one of Florence's set from the uh, Christmas Carol. We have Mr. Scrooge there with uh, Christmas present. Here's another one from the Christmas Carol. We have Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim. Here we have artist Joe Liptak on the left, showing some of his figures from the Jungle Book. And the fellow in the middle is Bob Gross, the president of Sawyer's. And I'm sorry to say I do not recognize the man on the right at this point. Here we see some work by Joe Liptak. On the left we have the Evil Queen and the Magic Mirror from Sleeping Beauty. And on the right we have Pinocchio. Uh, this is a scene from Gulliver's Travels. Uh, the sets were very well done as you can see by all the miniature ships. The actor that was hired to play Gulliver did not show up that day. So they had a big search throughout the entire plant and the first person they found that would fit the outfit was somebody from the paint shop and he became Gulliver. You will be forever famous for that. Here we have Hank Gaylord photographing a set. This one is from Robin Hood. If you notice, uh, there's just a single camera there. Um, Hank would use a rack over system to do the stereo pairs. And not only did he move the camera, but every once in a while he would move a figure or an item in the set itself to add to the 3D effect. He became very, very good at this. Here we have a photo of my late friend, Joe Liptak, super, super fella some of his work. Uh, Joe, unlike some of the other artists, was able to save a lot of his stuff by taking it home before it got thrown away. However, Joe had a major house fire and most of his work was also lost. There are some pieces out there still. We have a few. Uh, 3D Space has some, but the majority of his work is also gone, I'm afraid. Here we have Lee Heath Pearson working on one of the Bicentennial packets. Uh, the Bicentennial packets were a conglomeration of all the artists they had there. Uh, Joe and Lee and uh, Frank Massage and everybody basically worked on that. Here is another one of uh, Lee Heath Pearson. In this one she is... Uh, working on Raggedy Ann. She was one of the lead artists on that packet. Here we see a set shot from uh, the G.I. Joe packet. Uh, Friday afternoon to plant, not much going on, so they decided to mess with it a bit. Uh, the fellow in the suit standing there is Claude Basket. He was the writer that did most of the uh, booklets that came with the uh, Viewmaster packets. And the fellow pointing on the right there is the animation artist, Pete Dorset, who did most of the 3D cartoon cells. Here we see artist uh, Mary Lewis with one of the figures from The Little Yellow Dinosaur. Uh, my great honor to have this one in my collection. It was a gift from her. Uh, she and creative director Bob Johnson actually wrote the story for the packet, and it went over fairly well. 
here is uh, one of the original storyboard drawings she did for the Plagues of Egypt. Uh, before they started modeling, they would always do a sketch of this sort to work from. Here you see artist Martha Armstrong Hand with Captain Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, she didn't do the figures, but she did all the uh, uniforms. Uh, they were hand-stitched. It was as much work in a small one like that as there was a, in a real suit. Here we see some more of Martha's work. Uh, she was the main artist on the Bambi packet. Here we have Bambi and Thumper. Viewmaster did a lot of advertising in the 50s and 60s. And here we have the cast of the Danny Thomas show looking at Viewmasters. Here we have cowboy star Roy Rogers. Everybody knows Roy. Roy actually shot his own Viewmaster reels, and here he is mounting some. Here we have photographer Fred Binion, along with his Veriscope F40, which uh, Viewmaster was shooting at the time. And he's showing a Viewmaster image to Lassie. Fred Binion was one of the main photographers for the New York World's Fair. Uh, he says it was a lot of fun to shoot. However, there was a real problem. Every time he would turn around, one of the workmen tried to put his ladder away, thinking it was theirs. Here we have William Gruber on the right and Dr. Bassett on the left. They are working on the stereoscopic atlas of human anatomy, which was one of you master's major triumphs. Uh, the work was so well received that it still exists today in digital format and is still used to uh, teach students. Here we have Dr. Bassett doing a dissection of an arm. Glad it's not mine. Here we see the stereo atlas of uh, human anatomy at a medical show. Uh, they were sold in sec different sections. Section one and two were done at this point. And if you look closely, you see the uh, Model C viewers with the light attachments there that uh, the doctors could see the images. Here we have my very good and late friend, Charlie Van Pelt, giving out a commission check to one of the Viewmaster dealers. Charlie worked for Viewmaster forever, and I think most of you remember him from the NSA conventions. Here is another early shot of Charlie uh, demonstrating the uh, Viewmaster cameras at one of the counters. I'm not sure exactly where the store was, but I would love to shop there. Here is a photo of Diodario's camera shop in Hollyoke, Illinois. Uh, they had a major, major Viewmaster display, and they were one of the major de dealers in the area. Here is one of their window displays. Boy, I miss the old camera shops, don't you? They even went so far as having giant banners on buses advertising the Viewmaster. Here we have export manager Chuck White on the right demonstrating a Viewmaster camera. And here we have a picture of Chuck in South America. He was dealing with uh, twins in this country. I don't remember which. Uh, there was one country where he would only meet in the airport because they found out that he was a retired Air Force jet pilot. And the dictator of the country wanted him to stay there and train their Air Force. 
which Chuck had no interest in doing. Here we see Sawyer's president, Bob Brost. Uh, he was also a former big wig in the Keystone View Company before he went to Viewmaster. Here he is with an image that was used in the stockholders' reports showing all the Viewmaster product and the slide projectors and even the Garden Genie sprayer. Here we have the inventor of the Viewmaster, William Gruber, in his office at Sawyer's. And here again we have another shot of uh, William Gruber showing off some of the cameras he's about to order to his secretary, Miss May. This is sort of a sad picture for me. Uh, this is Norma Gruber next to the William Gruber Memorial Park plaque that was in the middle of the plant. Uh, we lost Norma some years ago. Uh, she was one of the nicest ladies I've ever met in my life. And I will miss her dearly forever. Okay, now we actually go into some 3D images. Uh, this one here is uh, the Clock Cleaners, one of the uh, Disney packets with uh, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. Uh, the set is by Frank Visage and Joe Liptak. And if you notice, Goofy is not in there yet. Uh, what they would do is they would just insert an outline like this, and then they would draw the appropriate cartoon and insert it later. Here is a scene from the same packet that's already finished. The ladder is actually a, a set that was uh, sculpted with the background, and then the cartoons of uh, Mickey and Goofy are entered after. Here is an, a very interesting shot. This is what the Viewmaster called the black box effect. When they were doing space shots, they used this to make everything look like it was distant. And uh, you have Frank Visage kneeling in the front. Uh, Joe Liptak is on the back adjusting the spaceship. Hank Gaylord is on top with his camera. Again, it's a rack over system, not a stereo camera. And that is uh, Bob Johnson, the creative director in the dark suit, looking on. Here is one of the space images that they did there. And if you look at the Viewmaster packet and what the actual space shots look like later, they got pretty darn close. It was amazing. Here is another one. Uh, sorry to say the film had pretty much completely turned color. I've restored it as best I could, but this is drilling on the moon. Uh, here is an image from a very little known system that Viewmaster was making. Uh, they from a reel and record set called Rhythms. Uh, they were gonna sell these to schools. It was part of the correlated classroom materials. Uh, the dripping sound of the uh, water was supposed to represent fairies. So again, the artists did work even for sounds. Here is another one from the rhythms packet, the ticking of the clock. Notice the superimposed face on the clock. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorites. This is a packet that Joe Liptak proposed and was never made, uh, much to my chagrin, because it would have been absolutely fantastic. It was going to be called Monkey Business. Here you have the monkey boss yelling into the phone so loud that the line is actually exploding. Uh, Joe's artistry in this is absolutely amazing. Here is a second scene from the monkey business set that uh, Joe Liptak created. Uh, this one, the boss is being shown a banana machine. 
Uh, Joe was able to save the figures. Uh, they were in his house, but uh, due to the house fire, these have all been lost now, too. So the few shots like this that remain are the only record that this ever existed. Well, I think I've been boring everybody long enough. I tried to get William Shatner to do the narration, so it would be a little smoother, but uh, he was busy, so you were stuck with me. Uh, in this image, we have creative director Bob Johnson on the left, photographer Fred Benyon in the middle, and on the right, we have travel expert Lowell Thomas, who edited a lot of the Viewmaster packets. There's a whole series that have his name up in the corner. If anybody wants to collect those, those are very well done and fun things to get. So I thank you all for listening, and goodbye.